Hey guys, this is going to be the second part of the video series and in this one, let's go over the retopology process in 2.13 which is still in a beta stage. Uh, retopology and low poly modeling is quite an essential part of making a uh, character for games uh, and other real-time applications. Uh, and for this project, I do not really have a particular budget or any technical requirement as this video series is mainly about uh, to share my work process and my workflow. Um, but however, saying that, I don't want to still go extremely heavy in terms of poly counts. So I'm mentally keeping a range of around 15 to 20,000 triangles as a budget for this entire character. Uh, this would definitely make it, uh, you know, extremely game friendly character either for consoles or mobile uh, applications. Okay, so for most of my production work, I've always used Maya for retopology, and I, actually, you can use any software, whether it's 3ds Max um, or Maya, for doing this sort of stuff, or Blender. To be frank, so uh, it's really not that important uh, as far as you can get the job done. Um, the the you know the updates that Topogon 3 showcase uh, that you know that made me really really excited, and you know I was curious to try it on. So apologies if this isn't the quickest way to work with the software, but as I'm still trying to get the hang of it. Let me take a step back and explain how I created those cylindrical geometries on the arm region or the wings region. Uh, I use uh, an option in Topogon called the tubes option. The shortcut is P in the keyboard and I basically draw circles across the mesh and then I hit create geometry to create those sort of cylindrical meshes. Uh, this is just much you know, quicker way to do those, uh, especially in those regions. Uh, and for the rest of the uh, you know region, I use a create tool uh, and a shortcut is C in keyboard for mostly drawing vertices and you know creating a face or a triangle. Okay, so the tool I'm using here is called the patch tool, and frankly, this is the tool that made me want to try to program. Uh, basically, you uh, draw splines with a specified subdivision and uh, connect it to an alternate spline with probably the same subdivisions or an existing edge loop with the same subdivisions, and it basically you know patches itself with uh, you know topology, and it's and it's really really useful for creating quick patches of um, you know uh, topology in regions, and it's much faster way to work. The great thing about this patch tool is that if you hover your mouse pointer across an edge and hit control and keep your scroll wheel up and down, you can change the subdivisions on the fly. Uh, also if you hover your mouse pointer to the central dot of the patch, you can actually change the topological flow of the patches simply by hitting control and scroll wheel as well. So it's such an exciting uh, new feature that you know it just saves a lot of time. Let me talk a little about topology here. Over the years, I find there are so many ways to do this. This is based on what the character is actually doing in game and what sort of animation he or she has. Uh, but also there are also macro factors that is involved. I mean, if this is a game character or is it a pre-rendered character or is it a film character? So all these things will surely affect the way in which we think about topology while doing these on characters.
let me talk about cylindrical shapes such as uh, arms, legs, tail wings, uh, spline, anything that is cylindrical in nature and in shape, right? I mean, these areas I try to basically keep it uh, a cylindrical tube uh, in terms of topology. Uh, for example, like a tail of a dragon would deform much better if the topology is actually a tube. I mean, it makes sense, right? And anything like a wrinkle, uh, like a feature on top of the tail could always be a, a cut in the edge loop for better deformation. Uh, talking about deformable areas, like having edge loops is really important, guys. I mean, for instance, areas such as the eyes or ankles or you know knees, it's always better to have circular loops that is you know running across uh, for better deformation. In this instance, I'm having the topology follow the shape of the mouth uh, for allowing better movement. Uh, in general, it's always best to have square-shaped topology across uh, the model as much as possible, guys. I mean, even if you have a rectangular polygon, I mean, it's always better to have a soft transition between the square-shaped, uh, uh, you know, polygon to the rectangle-shaped polygon. Um, and uh, talking about the shapes, I think um, triangles, I think, have a bad reputation, right? I mean, <laughs> so, uh, but I actually don't mind having triangles in the model. I mean, I do actually have some of them, uh, you know, specifically on some areas to get a better silhouette. I think the most important thing is that I avoid triangles in areas that are deformable. So when we talk about polygon shapes, I mean, it is very important to think about polygon distribution across the model uh, that captures the high poly as much as possible. Uh, it's very important to keep a, a close eye on the silhouette and make sure that topology does justice to the shape. I mean, for instance, when you think about, uh, you know, a circular shape, it is very important to, uh, you know, check if the low poly is also circular or actually angular. All of this comes down to the overall poly count you know that is required but it is something that is very really important that we keep an eye on in this instance the shape of the dragon's belly is actually really rounded right and i'm constantly checking if the low poly is actually capturing the roundness or if it's too angular Uh, on the wings, I um, mean, you can see the patch tool comes really useful. I mean, it got my job done in no time. And also, you can see me triangulating the edges um, to get a better silhouette, and it should be absolutely fine. Okay, guys, so the low poly is almost done, and I'm fixing up minor issues and welding the mirror geometry. Uh, but we are ready to take this model for UVing, and let's proceed with Ryzen UVs. All right, so let's talk about Ryzen MuleBees, which is a software which is new to me as well. Uh, but honestly, it didn't take me time to pick it up and it's really well designed and easy to use. Uh, I find Ryzen's uh, true potential is in its packing capabilities. You can pretty much pack anything the way you want based on materials, textures, objects, basically, uh, yeah, in just infinite number of ways. Okay, so UE packing too depends on several factors, like if this character is for a mobile uh, game or a console game, um, also, within the game, there might be several factors that dictate the way in which you UV characters, like such as uh, if the characters are modular or if there are any reusable elements and so on. Uh, but for this dragon, I'm keeping it simple one-to-one -one textures and um, having the seams pretty straightforward and except for the head, everything else is symmetrical and overlaid upon each other. Thanks to Ryzen, I got my UVs done really quick and as of next step, let's proceed to Mama's toolbag to bake some textures. Sweet, so let me not make you wait for the entire baking process, but I should just go over uh, uh, of my baking process. I exploded my mesh and uh, uh, baked the high poly and uh, low poly with sufficient distance and baked the basic maps that I can take forward to uh, Substance Painter. Okay guys, so we are done with the UV baking with this video and let's go forward to the next phase. Uh, thank you for watching.